was going to get somebody to lead prayer. Matt, can you lead prayer real quick? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day you've blessed us with. We're thankful for the opportunities that we can come and study your word. We're grateful for James and his ability to step in for Stephen. Please be with uh, all of our members here that are ill at this time, that are uh, suffering in hospitals and that are dealing with uh, multiple illnesses uh, at this time. Uh, Father, we're grateful for uh, everyone here. We're grateful for our health and we're grateful for our safety. Uh, Be with everyone here. Be with those who are listening online. Help us to always have unity within our body here. We're thankful for our ministers and we're thankful for our elders and deacons. Thank thank you for providing a church uh, family in the way that you have provided it for us. God, help us to be easily led. Help, uh, help the elders to have wisdom and courage to stand for the truth. God, be with each of us and help us to um, shoulder the armor of, uh, of God in a way that will be pleasing to you and that we can stand against those things that are Uh, difficult for us to to deal with in this life and those things that are in the spiritual realm as well. Forgive us of our sins. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, so the gospel letter, Galatians, the gospel letter talks about the singular gospel, and uh, Stephen talked about that a little bit in class, and is it going to go or not? There we go. All right. I hit it just right. Okay. So the singular gospel, he talked about in chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9 where Paul is rebuking the brethren there for going into a different message. Not really a different gospel because it's not the same thing. It's something completely different, a completely different message. And he says the message of salvation was brought, uh, planned out actually before creation. Ephesians 1, 4 tells us that. Galatians 4 verses 4 and 5 tell us that at the right time, God sent His Son to redeem us from our sins, to buy us back from the bondage of sin and slavery. And in Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9, Paul says it is unique. It is a singular gospel. It stands alone. There is nothing at all like it. Nothing in this world, no message that's provided by any other religion or any other religious group has anything in comparison or comes anywhere close to what the gospel is. And as Paul point, or Stephen pointed out last time, or in the previous two classes, the book kind of divides itself easily into three basic sections. Three basic section, or sections. The first one is the chapters 1 and 2, then 3 and 4, and 5 and 6. Pretty much any commentary or any one that you read or study that talks about this outlines it that way. There may be some minor uh, adjustments from one group to another. But that's pretty much how the book is unfolded and how it uh, spells itself out. And the first section there, chapters 1 and 2, is that there's a singular source, and God. And we're going to talk about that and uh, spend our time this morning, uh, evening talking about that. But there's a singular source, God. It didn't come from man. Second part is the singular message, justification by faith. Justification by faith, that's chapters 3 and 4. And it really kind of begins in chapter 2 and verse 15, but the bulk of chapters 3 and 4 is about this message. And then the third section is a singular walk in the Spirit. And uh, those are things that Stephen will talk about. He'll really start getting into justification by faith and the singular message next uh, Wednesday night. But as Stephen introduced that, he's going to wanted me to cover chapter Two tonight, and we're going to do a little bit of review here in chapter one before we get uh, dig into chapter two. But I try not to go too slow on this, and try not to spend too much time here in chapter one. But I think what we need to do is establish Paul's major premise here in chapters one and two about the singular source, and we do that in two ways. First is that first verse; he starts the book off in chapter one and in verse one with this statement. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So his very first statement is, Paul, an apostle from God. Not from men, not from any group of men. He didn't get his degree or his education in the gospel from any 
human agency. It came directly from Jesus Christ. And in verses 11 and 12, he further states this, or further clarifies it with this. He says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying is that God is the source of his gospel. Everything that he has, his message, his authority, all come directly from Jesus. He didn't go to any human institution. He didn't get it from anybody. He didn't get it from the apostles. He got it directly from God. And so that's his major premise here, at least in chapters 1 and 2. The source of this message is God. Why is that a big issue? Why is that a big deal, you think, for Paul to have to establish that? Anybody? Kind of scattered tonight, but All right, so they were deviating from the gospel into something that is completely different. He makes it very clear in, those, in that section that it's something completely different. It's not even the same thing. And uh, you know, Stephen talked about that in the uh, uh, first and the second classes. So I won't really go too much into that. I just want to kind of throw that out there and make a, show this to us, that this is Paul's primary focus here in these first two chapters. This is from God. The message is from God, and his authority as an apostle is from God, not from men. And then, so now that we've established the premise, we have to start thinking about how does Paul prove this premise? How does he prove that this is from God? Any guy, anybody can get up and say, I have a message from God. Uh, interestingly enough, I was in a meeting at work today, and, and uh, someone made a comment about, well, my truth. Well, this is my truth. And I'm looking and thinking, is it the truth or is it just your truth? And the way that the statement was being made was implying that, well, I didn't have to agree with it, but if, for this person it was the truth, their, their truth. Well, for Paul it's not that way at all. The message is the truth. It is not something that can be compromised. It's not something that can be changed. It's not something that can be looked at as, well, we can, it, true for you, but not for me. can't be that way at all. But Paul has to prove that. Paul has to show that. And he uses three things, or actually one thing in three sections that we're going to look at tonight that establishes how he can prove it's not from man. And do you know what that one overarching thing is that he uses to establish this? Anybody want to take a guess at it? All right, his conversion, but expand on that a little bit. Not just his conversion, the way it, all right, the way it came about, but his whole, all right, his whole life. Not just his conversion, but his whole life. In fact, what we're going to see is that they divide it into three categories here. His pre-conversion, his conversion, and his post-conversion. These three, two chapters, Paul is laying out his life and saying, look at my life. And what you see in my life is proof that this is from God, that my message and my authority are from God. Pre-conversion, post-conversion, or conversion itself, and then his post-conversion life. All of those things are evidence, proof, that his authority and his message are directly from God. Talk a little bit, and Stephen kind of went over this toward the end of class, but he kind of covered it quickly, and I want to spend a few minutes here reviewing this Pre-conversion. How would you describe Paul's pre-conversion life? Anybody? Zealous opponent of the church. Zealous Jew. All right. And not only a zealous opponent of the church, a chief persecutor. He was a powerful persecutor. And those are some passages that if you want to mark and make notes out to look at where Chapter 9, or chapter uh, 7, verses uh, uh, 58 through 8, 3 in Acts, and then chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, are the description of Paul's life prior to that event uh, in Damascus, what happened in Damascus. Chapter 22 and 26 are his self-description. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 is a self-description of his life prior to becoming a Christian, as is 1 Timothy 1, verse 13. 
Paul's talking about his life prior to becoming a Christian. He was a persecutor of the church. He had no interest in them except shutting them up, stopping them from talking, bringing an end to the sect of the Nazarene because he considered it blasphemy. So that describes who he was and his thinking about the church. And so as we think about that, I just wanted to kind of bring that out to you. Stephen covered it in class went last week, so we won't go over that in any more detail tonight. The second thing is his conversion. Let's go to his conversion. You were pointing that out. Uh, about his conversion earlier. That was a unique event. The conversion of Paul was one of those things that happened in a very unique way. In fact, what does he call it in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8? He calls this appearance of Jesus to himself as an something very, not a really harsh word. I see a, a look over there. No? He calls himself, he says, the appearance of Jesus was like an abortion. That's the word that's used. It's just a child untimely born is the way it's translated in most texts. But it was something that was just so unusual. And it's important to understand that this is so unusual because, uh, at least for us today, because what do we see a lot of people doing in the world today and their desire for a Damascus experience? They want to have some kind of experience. They want to be like the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul's experience, this was the only one post-resurrection and post-ascension appearance of Jesus recorded. That's why Paul gives it such a unique status in 1 Corinthians 15. And this was not something that happens to anybody else. And why did Jesus appear to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus? And then send him into the city of Damascus so Ananias could tell him what to do to be saved and what his work was going to be. Why, did that, why was that necessary? Paul was just another guy that was going to go out and preach a little bit here and there? He was born out of due time. All right, he was born out of due time. And he had what? A very unique, a singular ministry. What was his ministry going to be? Gentiles. To the Gentiles. He was called to reveal Jesus to the Gentiles. Look in Galatians chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 1. And read verses 15 and 16, the first half of verse 16. Verse 15 says this, But when God who set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. And when you go and read the accounts in Acts, He's told, you're going to suffer. But again, Stephen talked about that, so we're not going to repeat that this evening. So His conversion is a very unique experience, is for a very unique purpose. He has a unique duty that nobody else had. And so anybody claiming that they're having a Damascus experience today, uh, you ask them, okay, you're going to go out and, and be beaten and thrown in jail and executed for Christ? Well, no, count me out on that. I just want to have an experience so I can be, feel good about myself. Most people are not going to be willing to do what Paul did. And God called Paul for this unique reason. Next thing is is post-conversion life, post-conversion life. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about this tonight. How does this post-conversion life proof, uh, prove that God supplied the gospel to him instead of mankind? Anybody? kind of pictures three different alibis kind of where he was and tries to make the picture and paint the picture that I wasn't even with these men I was in Arabia for three years I was not even in Jerusalem basically making the alibi statements that he does here that you're about to talk about all right exactly he he starts off by saying for the first three years of his life or his post-conversion life as a preacher he is nowhere near any apostle. He has no connection to them whatsoever. In fact, it says that he was a powerful preacher without human input. Notice in uh, verse 18, or verse 6, let's go to the last half of verse 16 and first half of, uh, and all of verse 17. It says, after he, uh, God was pleased to uh, call him and send him out to preach, he said, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So there he's restating the premise, but he's now providing evidence of it. He says, I didn't go talk to anybody. 
I didn't go down to Jerusalem and meet with the apostles. They didn't come up here and meet with me. I didn't do any of those things. I didn't consult with anybody, really. Nor, verse 17, did I go to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. And so he was in Arabia and in Damascus for about three years. Interesting thing is that when you go and you read about this in the book of Acts, it's kind of deceiving there, the language, because it doesn't tell you how long. It says immediately he began to preach in the, the synagogues there in, in uh, Damascus, and then he was preaching and teaching, and everybody was surprised by this guy that was up here to, con to convict and to arrest and jail and carry off all these teachers of the gospel, or this message about this Jesus guy, he's up here preaching it. He's all of a sudden now a proclaimer of that same message that he was supposed to be attacking. And he's not sitting around getting that information from anybody. He's not sitting down with them and saying, okay, now what am I supposed to teach? What am I supposed to believe on this subject? What, is it, what does God want me to say in this? It's all coming from God. And then it says after a long while, he goes up to Jerusalem. But it doesn't say how long. So the book of Acts doesn't tell us how long he is up there in Arabia, it doesn't say anything about being in Arabia, but doesn't say how long he's in Damascus. The Galatian letter tells us how long. It says, I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, verse 18, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas. So finally, after three years of getting revelation from God, of preaching the gospel, confronting people about, uh, confronting the Jews about the gospel of Christ, he finally goes up to Jerusalem to meet Peter. He wants to go up there and meet the other, one of the, the leading apostles, considered the leading apostle. In fact, the first half of the book of Acts basically was about Peter. Second half is about, uh, mostly about to Paul. And so he's going to go up and meet him. And he goes up to Jerusalem, and we won't take the time to read the account in Acts chapter 9, but it's fascinating how he goes up there. He probably preaches to the very same people that he was, that he was siding with when they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And what happened? How long did he last in Jerusalem? All right, 15 days, a whopping two weeks. Now, some of you... Anybody here had COVID for two weeks? It seemed like forever, but it's over after two weeks. It's over pretty, uh, pretty much gone. No, it's not for 15 days. That's it. After 15 days, he has to leave Jerusalem. Why does he have to leave Jerusalem after 15 days? Anybody remember? persecution. In fact, he had a vision. Jesus spoke to him in the temple and told him what? They're going to kill you. Get out of Jerusalem. And there was a plot to kill him, so he got out of Jerusalem. And what did he do? Where did he go then? Did he go uh, hang out with the apostles in some secret enclave somewhere? Tarsus. Where? Tarsus. All right, he went to Tarsus. Yeah, Tarsus. He went home. So he went home. He was exiled to Tarsus and the interesting thing again is that the text says nothing about how long that is. Acts chapter 9 doesn't tell us how long that is. Um, we really don't, and, and even Galatians doesn't say exactly how long that is. But if you do the math on it and you work on it, it comes out to about seven years. So for about seven years, Paul is off up in Tarsus and in Cilicia and Syria. In fact, he says in the text there, verse uh, 19, I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So he was gone up in the middle of nowhere for a number of years. What do you think he was doing while he was up there? Sitting back twiddling his thumbs? Preaching. In fact, we can know that he was preaching and teaching because of some events that he describes in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. What does he describe in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that happened to him in a number of places or a number of times. Five times beat, uh, uh, whipped by the Jews. How many times does the book of Acts record those whippings by the Jews? Or how many of those whippings by the Jews are recorded in the book of Acts? Zero. None of them. 
And if you do the math based on when he wrote the book of Corinthians, it was probably during this time frame when he's up there in Syria and Cilicia. So what do you think he did when he got home to Tarsus? Besides preaching, who do you think he went and preached to? Home, his home, his family, his home synagogue, his family. And what do you think probably happened? Rejected and whipped. I mean, it would, be, it would be an ugly, nasty thing. You know, you think, how many of you ever got a whipping in, in school? You know, got a paddling in school. Anybody? All right. I've got a few hands up there. All right. You know, two or three swats with a wooden paddle. Oh, please, don't do that to me anymore. Well, it was, in, it was embarrassing, but that's a different story. I mean, they would take him, strip his shirt off, strip his robe off, expose his back, and whip him 38 or 39 times to make sure that they didn't go over 40, which the law was limited in the law. But this would be a brutal, ugly event. That's why Paul, in many ways, was a walking scar. He was, stu- he was beaten twice by the Romans. Well, one of those is described in, in Philippians, I mean, in Acts that happened in Philippi. But another, so there was another beating. So th- this was a, a time frame where he's out there preaching and teaching and working, preaching the gospel. Proclaiming the gospel message. So he's doing what God told him to do. And so this is kind of, in a sense, another way, even though he doesn't talk about it here in Galatians, but it's another a line of evidence that this is a message from God. Because what would he have done if this was a message from man after about the second or third beating? What would most of us do? Hmm? Give up. We would say, that enough of this nonsense. I didn't sign up for this. Well, Paul's faith is in God. He has one source for his message. God... Uh, by revelation of Jesus Christ, and he is not going to quit teaching about it. And so that's where he is for about three years, uh, about seven years up there in Galatia, or in uh, Tarsus and in Syria and Cilicia. And after that, approximately 45 A.D., listen, guessing he was converted around 35 A.D., and so he uh, goes to, uh, uh, he's three years away, and so then he goes off into, into back up to Syria and Cilicia, for from about 38 to 45, so the, about seven years. What happens to him then? What, what happens when he's up there? How does he come back from his exile? Who went and looked for him? All right, Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? Barnabas went and looked for him. Barnabas is the one who told the, Jew, the uh, apostles and the folks down there in Jerusalem when he first came down there, said, hey, he's safe. You can trust him. And then when Barnabas is sent up to Antioch of Pisidia to teach up there with the church where they were teaching Gentiles, he said, I know just the guy to work with me. It's that Saul of Tarsus. And so he went up there to look for him and found him and brought him back down there to work with them in the, uh, there in uh, Antioch. And then somewhere after about a year, there was a prophet who said there's going to be a, a, a famine down in Jerusalem, and the, uh, the church there in Antioch decided to send money down to the church, and guess who they sent it with? Any guesses? Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, they sent it down. That's in Acts chapter 11, and verses 27 through 30. So that gets us to chapter 2, which is interesting Stephen and I were kind of joking about this a little bit, that of all the places for him to have me step in and teach, it's the one area where we have the greatest disagreement is in Acts chapter 2. I mean, excuse me, in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians 2, Stephen thinks that the events in Galatians 2 preceded the events in Acts chapter 15, whereas I think that, this, that Galatians 2 is describing the Jerusalem conference. In fact, it was such a bone of contention between me and Steve that Stephen that we decided what we would do is we would duke it out and I made him sick so he couldn't come so I could teach it. No actually what happened was I laughed I said I'm not going to spend any more time on this than I already have. It really doesn't matter. It's not a faith issue and nobody really knows. So if you want, that's one of those topics that people can talk about till uh, they're blue in the face and but we're just not going to do that in class. Because regardless of whether this was that first trip when Timothy or when Paul and Barnabas and Titus went down to Jerusalem to bring alms, even though Titus isn't mentioned in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas go down there. Or if it's some other unrecorded 
visit to Jerusalem, or if it's the Acts 15 event, they're all about the same issue. It's about the same issue. And that issue is the imposition of Judaism on the New Testament church, and particularly on Gentiles. And so let's talk a little bit about this fact that this is another form of evidence that Paul's apostleship came from God and not from man, is in his description here in Genesis, Galatians 2 about his withstanding the authorities. Four times he refers to them as the powers that be or those of reputation. And in the end, what does he say they did for him? They supported him. To the, to the, yeah. They basically, they stuck out there and said, Paul, you're doing a good job. We agree with what you're doing. We're not, we have nothing to add to it. We have nothing to take away from it. What you're doing is right. They, he approached them as an equal as a, in a, as, rather than as a supplicant or someone that was beneath them and needing their permission and their authority to do anything. A couple of ways. What we're going to do the rest of this uh, time tonight is look at this. It's been our last 15 minutes looking here in chapter 2. And what uh, Paul was trying to do here as far as establishing his authority from, was, came from men instead of, or from God instead of men, is by how he withstood those who were authorities, how he stood against them. The first thing that we see is in verses 1 and 2. First, let's read Galatians 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. And so the 14 years gives us a time frame. Uh, we won't get into that tonight. But notice in verse 2 why he went up. Who sent him up there? All right, God did. When he says, I went up by revelation, God told him to do this. This was something that came from the Lord. You go up to Jerusalem and, and discuss this issue. Resolve this issue. What does that mean didn't happen? And that's a broad question, isn't it? Don't you hate those kind of questions? You know, name one thing and then say, what does that leave out? Well, it leaves out a whole lot. All right. What it shows us is that the apostles and the elders from the church in Jerusalem didn't call him down and say, hey, you preacher up there, you come down here and let us tell you what you're doing wrong and tell you what you're supposed to be doing. That's not what happened. He was sent up by revelation. The Lord sent him up there. And so he was sent by God to go up there and to effectively confirm with them that what they were teaching and what he was teaching was the will of God. And it says they met privately here in verse 2. For fear that I might be running or had run in vain. What's he afraid of? Is he afraid that his message is wrong? Think about that for a minute. What's he afraid of? What, what's Paul afraid of there in verse 2? All right, that's a, a, a tricky question. Is he afraid that his doctrine was false? We got a hand raised over here? All right. All right, well, yeah, that's the issue. We'll talk about that in just a moment. What's it? It, it does, it does, but what he's in that kind of town, the answer is the question from this standpoint. His concern is not that they're going to be right and he's going to be wrong. I think his concern is that they're going to contradict him and they're going to stand up for the Judaizers and try to impose Judaism on Christianity. I think that's what he's afraid of. And if that's the case, then his work has been, will be thwarted. It will be undermined because he's at cross purposes with the other apostles. Because he has no doubt what his message is and who it's from. So he's not doubting his message. All right, so I think we need, that's important for us to understand that, that. That's what he's saying there in verse 2. So he's confirming that. And then, so 
they go up and they have the discussion, and whether it's in the same, um, same thing as Acts chapter 15, same event, or just the same topic, same subject, it, it's the idea of, of uh, not having to keep the law. And that's something uh, Stephen will get into next week uh, and, and through the rest of the class. Who were those of reputation? When he says that, he says that in verse 3, or excuse me, in verse 2, and then again in verse 6, and then also in verse 9. Who are those of reputation? All right, I'll give you one of them, Peter. All right. Peter, James, and John, except there's one little trick. Those are not the same three that were with Peter at the, uh, that were at the Mount of Transfiguration and the three that were pulled off. Who's missing from that three in this context? Yes, the James here is the brother of Jesus. Remember, James was killed earlier. James the Apostle, the brother of John. The Peter, James, and John that were with, the, with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration and that were with him in the garden on the night before his crucifixion, that James of that group is dead. This is James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. All right, so that's the three people that he says there are of reputation. And Paul wasn't, and some people say Paul was being uh, sarcastic, with the way he used these terms. I don't think that's necessarily so. I think what he's doing, he's making the point that these, these guys were men of reputation, but they're my equals. Let's read verse 6 and 9. In, in verse 2 we read that earlier. Let's read verse 6. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. So Paul's making it clear, we're equals. They're not above me, they're not beneath me, they're equals, they gave me nothing that I didn't already have. Where did he get his message? This is the key to this, this whole point here that he's making. His singular source is God. He didn't get it from them, either pre, at, at or after his conversion. The message that he got is from God, and so he's speaking directly from God, and so He's establishing that by virtue of the fact that when he was in Jerusalem, rather than having to uh, kowtow to or bow down to them and submit to them, he approached them as equals. And again in verse 9, it says this is, uh, you, Matthew mentioned this earlier, and recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So he's making it very clear. They stuck out their hand and said, you guys are teaching the truth. Keep going. They had nothing to add to it. They had nothing to take away from it. They didn't give him any stamp of approval in the sense that until they did so, he was, there were questions about him. There was never a question about where his message came from and where his authority came from. Never thought a question on that. All right, let's go to the next thing in there, and that is, what was the conclusion? What was the conclusion? They rejected Judaism as required for the Gentiles. The Jews could live as Jews all, the, all they wanted, as long as they didn't require it as part of being a Christian. In fact, the Apostle Paul is arrested in the temple because he's in there participating in a Jewish practice. He was a Jew. He had Timothy circumcised. Why did he have Timothy circumcised? But why does he say in verse 3, and this was the flashpoint issue, circumcision, verse 3, but not even Titus who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Because he was a Greek. The, yeah, he was not a Jew. There was no obligation. There was nothing that required him to be a, a become a Jew, to live as a Jew. And it's interesting, and I, want, I do want to turn over to Acts chapter 15, and I want to read something here that I think is fascinating from the Apostle Peter, who makes the point in this chapter in this, uh, during the uh, Jerusalem conference. Peter's talking there, and he's talking about how God had appeared to him and gave him the vision of the, uh, the uh, meats that were clean and uh, 
animals that were unclean and unclean and said, what I have cleansed is no longer unclean. And then he goes to, uh, to Cornelius, the house of Cornelius. Peter recounts that here in chapter Acts 15. But I want you to notice what he says here. He says in verse 9, or verse 10, Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? He's talking about the Jewish law. I'll leave that to Stephen to talk about later. Verse 11 says this, But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. I love the way Peter puts that. He's saying that we, the Jews, he's talking we as Jews, they are the Gentiles. He's saying we, the Jews, are saved in exactly the same way that the Gentiles are saved. So he reverses it. You would think he said, well, the Gentiles are saved the same way we Jews are saved. He flips that and says, the Jews, we Jews are saved the exact same way the Gentiles are saved. There's no different gospel for Jew or Gentile. And that, that gospel is not filtered through Judaism because that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to say, all right, well, you can be a Christian if you become a Jew also. And that's why circumcision would be an obvious flashpoint because they would say if you were a male who converted to Jesus and you had then to become a Jew, which meant you had to be circumcised. And Paul said, and Barnabas said, no, not happening. No, that's not the gospel message. Christianity is not filtered through Judaism. Christianity stands alone. Faith in Christ stands alone. It is unique. That's why I keep calling it the singular gospel. There's nothing like it. It is all by itself. And so that's why he's saying that this is what you need to, uh, to accept or believe. All right, thoughts, comments? Okay. All right, let's go to the last thing here I want to talk about, spend the last few minutes talking about. And this is verses, go back to Galatians chapter 2. And this is his rebuke of Peter. We'll read verses 11 through 14. Because not only does Paul go down to Jerusalem as a peer, an equal of Peter, James, and John, and the apostles, he also confronts Peter for his sin and rebukes him for being wrong, calls him down in front of the entire church in Antioch. Now, there's no other record of this event. We don't, again, that's one we don't know for sure when this happened. But when, uh, verse 11, we'll read verses 11 through 14. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. All right, when did he start that? Go back to Acts chapter 10 when he was sent to Cornelius, the house of Cornelius. So he was eating with the Gentiles. That would be a very un-Jewish thing to do, but he was doing that because God had made it clear that this was the right way to live with the Gentiles and associate with Gentiles. But when certain men from James came, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So these brethren came up, these big shots came up from Jerusalem that were friends of James, the half-brother Jesus, and they were all concerned about, you know, we don't know the inner workings, but you can imagine the conversation that went on when they arrived at this. Peter, what are you doing eating with these Gentiles? You know the unclean meats that they, what are you doing? And instead of saying, I'm doing exactly what God told me to do years before when he appeared to me, when he gave me the vision and sent me to Cornelius, what did he start to do? What did he cave in to? Peer pressure, exactly. Peer pressure doesn't work, does it? On adults, on grown-ups? Ever? No, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, it works. It works on all of us. We all have to fight that. We all have to be aware of the fact that, that people will try to force us to do something to go along with them, and sometimes we should, and sometimes we should say no. But what, notice what he says to him. Prior, so these, these men came up from James and he withdrew because he was afraid of how this would look and how they would treat him. Verse 13, notice the impact Peter's example had. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. All right, so he starts off, he's saying, here's what he did. Notice what he calls it beginning in verse 13. Hypocrisy. 
So he says one thing, teaches one thing, but now when he's under the gun, under pressure, he draws back and he does something completely different. He pulls away from doing what he was teaching. With the result, then verse 13, the impact is the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. And so you had a mixed group there. You had Jews and Gentiles, and they were fellowshipping one another, and they were spending time together, and the Gentiles were eating with the Jews, and the Jews were eating with the Gentiles, and everything was great, and they were growing and growing and growing. And all of a sudden, here these guys come, these big shots come from Jerusalem, and all of a sudden you got a division in the church. And one man could have stopped it. And that would have been Peter. But who had to stop it? Because Peter didn't. Paul. Paul had to step up and say, this is not right. Notice what he goes on to say. I mean, he leaves, he, he leaves no stone unturned in, in accusing Peter here of doing wrong. He says, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Imagine that Barnabas was this great, this great worker that spent, loved Paul so much and they worked together so much. And all of a sudden, Barnabas was pulled away by this. Verse 14, but when I saw that they were not straightforward, so here he's calling them, they're being dishonest. They're not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So by withdrawing, he's basically saying, well, you know, the Judaizers are right. You Gentiles have to live like us. We can't live like you and be Christians. And so Peter is a sta- uh, Paul here is making it very clear. This, his post-conversion life is showing that he withstood all the authorities because the authorities meant nothing unless they were in compliance and, 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 and fit within what God had revealed. And Paul had that message that God had revealed that came from the Lord himself. So Peter is a, Paul here has established that his message, his authority as an apostle, came from God, not from men, because when it came down to standing for the truth, he would stand for the truth no matter what it cost him, no matter whom he had to accost. He was going to stand for the truth. And I tell, that's a hard calling, isn't it? Because what do we not want to risk. Social disruption. We don't, want to, we don't want to risk disapproval. And so we pull our punches, so to speak. We, we draw back. We keep our mouths shut when we should say some things. Sometimes we say, we open our mouths when we should keep them shut. But we, open, we, we need to learn to be able to stand firm like Paul did. Paul got his message from the God, from the Lord, not from men. Stephen will pick up next week with verse 15 in chapter 2 on justific- and the message of justification by faith. Thank you.